do that in a second. So the tutoring center has this thing that they call the mole wheel, which I think looks like a giant, like, Trojan horse death metal trap. So I'm not a huge fan of it, but it works. Okay. One of the things that you'll notice that is very central to it would be... Mole of atoms and... Moles. Yeah. So pretty much everything you need to be doing when doing conversions is getting into moles. If you're given something that is not moles, make it moles, then start to think about how you can convert out of it. Okay. So be aware of that. If you want to go to the tutoring center and grab that, you can. Uh, that is up to you. The other thing that I'll mention is that the tutoring center also offers little workshops. So they've got a workshop this Friday, November 3rd. I thought I posted an announcement about it. You did. I did? Okay. Um, so this Friday they're doing a workshop from 11.30 to 1 p.m. on moles. It's called Part 2. Really all that means is Part 2 is they're talking about using moles in chemical equations. Part 1 was using moles with chemical formulas, which we did on Monday. So part two is doing what we are doing today, looking at chemical equations and how you can convert moles. Okay? One of the things that they will talk about within the tutoring center is dealing with moles and gas conversions. We will get to that. Uh, you probably read about that already. Uh, we'll talk about it probably next week. I am very anti that mole to gas conversion. We'll deal with that or cross that bridge when we get there. Okay? Um, I am anti almost everything else that's taught in the course, right? Common complaint. I'm not anti it, I just think it's silly to talk about it. Okay. So, formula usage. If we had this as a wheel, okay, and we had to come up with directions to tell somebody how to put this wheel together, what would we tell them? Well, we're going to start with the central axis. Okay, we need an axis. Okay, what else do we need? How many axes, axes, axes. axes do we need? One. Okay, we need one axis. What else do we need? Spokes. Okay, we need spokes. How many spokes? Depends. Well, we could go through and count. I'm going to guess it's 32. For the spokes, it's 32 tends to be fairly standard. So if you go through and count that, I think there's 32 spokes. Is there a piece of knowledge that we put in your pocket and save for later? <laughs> so I guess that did not come out at the beginning of the semester. I used to cycle to work, bike to work, three times a week. So I frequently ride bicycles, and I happen to know that the standard spoke count is 32. I rode bikes for a long time. I didn't know it was 32 spokes. I had to put them together, too. That makes sense. <laughs> All right, so 32 spokes. What else do we need? The distance right. between the axis and the edge. So the, uh, the spoke is going to define that, or a rim is going to define that. So once we have the rim, we don't need to know that distance. How many rims do we need? One. one. Just one rim. That says one. Okay, what else do we need? Okay, and a tire. And one tire. One tire. Okay, to build this one wheel, that's what we would need. Okay. We need the tube inside the tire as well. Right. We need the tube inside the tire. That's, wow. I'm perfectly okay with that too. I'm fine with that. So we need all of those parts. If I take all of those parts, what can I make? One wheel. I can make one wheel. One wheel. What did we just write? A chemical equation. Okay. This is a chemical equation. This is exactly what our chemical equations tell us to do. Okay. The reason why chemical equations get tricky for students is that with a wheel, what can you do? Well, you can grab it, you can look at it, you can feel it, you can touch it. Can you do that with a molecule? No. no. So you have to kind of project out and say, okay, if I could do that, these are the things that go into it. I would make the argument that chemistry is a hell of a lot easier than assembling a wheel. Because when we go through to assemble our chemistry or our molecules, how many different starting materials do I usually add in? Maybe two things. Okay. What are the amounts that I'm usually adding? Okay. The numbers aren't 32. Okay. Maybe we scale up to like 10, and that's a really rare exception. Usually the coefficients in front are 1s or 2s. Okay. 
So our chemical equations are simpler versions of this. How do the chemical equations become more difficult? When we put stuff together, do we end up with only one thing? No, sometimes we end up with two things. Okay? So we don't get a perfect correlation, but it works fairly well. Okay? So chemistry is merely taking objects that are already there and trying to assemble them. Okay? Unfortunately, we can't see those individual objects. We have to use our imagination. And this is where our imagination is awesome because it works. Okay? So we then quantify it, write that down so that we can then use that information later on. Okay? What are the units on each of those numbers that I put in there? Kind of a weird question. What is the unit on this one? Wheel, wheel. wheel is the substance. Okay. In chemistry, what is our unit? Okay. A mass. Okay. In a chemical equation, do we use mass? No. What is our unit in a chemical equation? Do we need a chemical equation? H2 plus O2 to make H2O. If we balance that, 2 and 2. Now we have our chemical equation balanced out. Okay. To go through and put this together, so we still get some pieces on, well, how did this actually work? Okay, well, let's apply this back to our system. I don't understand. H2. Okay, well, that's confusing. When you buy spokes, do they come in packs of 32 or do they come in packs of, I don't know, 120? they're probably coming in packs of 120. Because if we had to individually wrap 32, that's all happening at the distributor. They have to put in a whole bunch more parts or packaging behind the system. When you get your Amazon box, you bought like a candle, and they send you a 5 by 5 foot box for a 2 inch candle. Like what the hell were you doing, Amazon? That didn't make any sense. Okay? We don't want that extra packaging. We want to minimize it. So if we look at bringing in the spokes, more than likely, I'm getting a whole lot more than 32 spokes from the distributor. But I have to separate out of that packaging that 32. What's happening with the chemical formula? H2 is what our distributor is doing. Right? I then have to manipulate that information. How much do I have to take from that distributor, that packaging, and divide that out to make my final product? It's the same process. Okay. So what is our unit, back to our question, what is the unit over here? The measurement is 2, the substance is H2O. What is the unit? A molecule. What is the unit for a wheel? Okay, we keep saying a single wheel. What is a molecule? It's a substance. We're being more particular with that substance. What could we use as our unit for wheels? Okay. We could use something like molecule. It doesn't make sense because molecule is chemistry. Okay. We could say this is one part, which is a wheel. We've defined the class. It is now a part of that system or of a bicycle. The wheel is the substance that makes up that part. A molecule is the class. The specific molecule is water. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So when we go back to this again, our unit is just, it's a, a piece. It's a count. Okay. What if I change that to gram? What if I said the unit for all of those is grams? Would that make sense? No, because they're all different things. Okay. If I take one gram axis, 32 grams of spokes, one gram of rims, one gram of tires, and one gram of tubes, and I smash that all together, am I going to end up with one gram of anything? No. 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 What does the chemical equation not tell you about? How to put it together. Mass. 
What it tells you is the number of pieces that go into it. Well, what does the chemical equation tell you? The number of pieces. It's the same thing. Okay? So we can't look at a chemical equation and say, well, it's two grams of water. No. It's two molecules of water. It's two units of water that go into this. Okay? Again, with the wheel, it's not too bad because I can pick up a spoke and be like, well, that's one spoke. I can pick up one wheel and be like, that's one wheel. Okay? Can I do that for the chemical equation? No. Why not? The atoms in chemistry or the molecules in chemistry are so small that I can't grab a single unit of them, which means I have to grab a whole lot of them so that I can actually have something to grab a hold of. Okay? That whole lot, what is that measurement that I've now defined? A mole. So instead of grabbing a single unit of hydrogen, or really two units of hydrogen, and a single unit of oxygen, I'm going to grab two massive amount of units of hydrogen and one massive amount of oxygens. That massive amount is my scalar factor, and since it's now defined, it is consistent across the board. And it can become two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen. It's still an amount. It's still a counting effect. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So, simple instructions on how to build a bicycle. Because you already did it with the spoke. Let's go through and attempt this. We take a frame. And we take two wheels, right? Mm -hmm. One frame, two wheels. We now have a chemical equation to build that bicycle. For those of you that know there's more parts on a bicycle, fair enough. Just keep it simple. I mean, we could do something like this, too. There you go. There's even pedals. So just two wheels, and now all the rest of the parts, which we'll call the frame. Kind of make sense? Okay, so that is our chemical equation. I'm not going to hit the next button and my beautiful chemical equation drawing is going to disappear. Well, it's, never mind. It will appear even prettier. Okay, so we could condense that instead of showing two wheels. We could show that as two times the number of wheels. Chemical equation. Okay. Someone built four bicycles. How many wheels and frames were used? Eight wheels, four frames. How did you do that? It organically made sense to do that. It organically made sense to do that. That is something that I would argue pretty much everybody in this room could do in their head. Right? Everybody just went, eh, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. So now what I want you to go through and do is stop doing this organically in your head. And it's not that you're doing it wrong for this. But the instant I move it into chemistry terms, you're now confused and lost because you don't have the process for doing this. So establish a process for how you came up with that answer. Okay? For every one, let's come back to that. One frame equals two wheels. Right? That's what our chemical equation tells us. Okay. Did we use that to actually solve this? Really? I started with four bikes. What was I trying to figure out? How many wheels and frames you need? What did you do? I mean... I guess you could put it this way. I set the products to four bikes, and then I balanced everything else. Okay, so we hit, heard another option, set the product to being four bikes. Work backwards. Okay, that's fine. Well, then what were you given? Well, you, you were given that two wheels and one frame equals one bike. So so how many I did not say that. 
That has not been written down yet. So you're now adding some more information. And I agree, you're right, but that wasn't said. One frame equals two wheels, which equals one bike. One bike. Okay. So we've added more information here. That's still information that was buried in the chemical equation. I'm not saying that wasn't valid. It just never was written down. I want to, again, use that information to set up this conversion. Right. You saying you got four bikes. What did you do? What did you start with to get four bikes? So that's in the question. Not the question the says, how many wheels and frames were used? Someone built four bikes, so we have that. Okay, so what are you doing with that? Okay. Because you went through and said that it required four frames and eight wheels. Where did those numbers come from? Your scary brain. Your scary brain, that's what I'm saying. Give me a process. Walk me through how you did that calculation. Nothing up there says anything about eight wheels or four bikes or four frames. One frame plus two wheels equals one bike. So one frame equals two wheels equals one bike. Not, none of that says eight. None of that says four. Right, so we're Isn't that your conversion one. factor? Is that a conversion factor? Sort of. It's an expression that I can get a conversion factor from, which, again, you have done. You've internalized. Stop internalizing. Formalize it. That's what I'm asking you to tell me. Use them as units. Set this up. Use it with units how? Which expression do you want to use? We've got two expressions started up there. We've got red and we have purple. Well, we do the, well, uh, we, do, the, we do the purple line. So let's pause purple for line. a second. You told me the answer was eight wheels, yes? yes. Yeah. You told me the answer was four frames, yes? yes. Where up there do I have any work to say that is the answer? You haven't given me any information to prove that. I don't understand. Explain it to me. Uh, convert it just like what we were doing with moles. So times what is convert? Times what? Yes, getting so, at the right idea. So times under one bike or BK, whatever you want to use. So you cancel out the bike and then you add in uh, one frame on the top. Then times again... So wait, I've got frame on the top. Or What's the number with frame? Uh, one frame. One frame. What's the number with bike? Uh, one. One bike. Do same with wheels, but two wheels, one bike. So times and then do bike two. again down here and, and wheels up here? Because mm -hmm. now, now you still have bike on the bottom. I have bike showing up on the bottom again. Okay, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear this. Oh, well, something's going wrong. Yes, <laughs> that's the exact issue. You've internalized and done two separate calculations and gave me the answer as one answer. You did two things, but you've jammed those two things into one system and you aren't separating that information out. Because you aren't separating that information out, you can't Solve. You can't explain to me how you did it. So I did it. That's awesome if I'm going to continue to talk about bikes and frames. Except this is a chemistry class and I'm not going to continue to talk about bikes and frames. You need to trust your method to be able to get to a correct answer for something that you do have tangible results for. So that when we move to things where we don't have that tangible result, you can rely on the method. Okay? So I like where you're going with this. Okay? We needed that information. But if we did that, our unit systems don't work. Okay? We said we did two calculations. Do it in one. Okay. One frame plus two wheels over one bike. How many answers are being asked for? Two. Two, which means we have two conversions. Two conversions. Uh, what were you trying to do? One. Do two conversions in one thing. We can't do that in this case because those conversions run counter to each other. Come on, eraser. Okay. So what happens if we just do that conversion? What do I get? The number of frames. 
the bike unit becomes converted into frames. Four times one, which is four. Four, the unit being frames. frames. What answer did you tell me about frames before? Four frames. What did we just show? Yeah? There it is. There's work to say four frames. Does that work say anything about the number of wheels? No. No. So maybe we should think about wheels. Four bikes, each having one frame equals four frames. Yep. Okay. So we need to bring wheels into the system. So actually, I'm going to erase that for a second. I want wheels. So you have to start with bikes again. Do I have to start with bikes again? Well, that's what, that's what you no, have. Not exactly. I'm given four bikes. Yes, I, am st I can start with four bikes. Could I start with something else? We could start with frames because we know how many frames. So we now have two places that we could start this. Both of them should get us to the exact same answer. Hi. So you can start with frames and you can test. Let's see if, if we come out. Is, is Mike right? Do we get the same answer? Yes. I sure hope so. Well, one one. What are we trying to do to the bikes? We're trying to make the unit of bikes equal the unit of wheels, wheels which means we do this, we do the same, thing. So same one thing. One bike equals two wheels. Two wheels. Where did you get the two from? Where did you get the one from? From the conversion. From our chemical equation, which you guys decided to write out as equalities. I'm okay with that. That's fine. That extra equality step is, to me, by default, written in the equation. You decided that you wanted it written out as an equality, that's fine. Okay. You're just being extra specific in your equalities. That information is in the chemical okay. equation. Well, as an equality, it's wrong. What part of that is wrong? Uh, so, I see where you're going with that. One frame leads to, or is composed, right. needs so, two wheels so to make one bike. You need, yeah. you so, those are not... What, uh, I don't even know what symbol to put in there. Who's a mathematician? Oh, okay. I'll accept a plus. That <laughs> totally made sense. <laughs> one frame plus two wheels equals one bike. You mean... Two next to the symbol of a wheel, next to the symbol of a frame, arrow equals one by oh yeah, this is that expression. They are one and the same. One decided to show pictures, the other one decided to show words. Which is easier for you to do? Words have meaning, pictures are it's up to you. Okay. Pictures could be interpretive. Okay. If Picasso drew that bicycle, um, I'm not very good with uh, Picasso, but maybe Picasso says something like this with his bicycle. Okay. And you're like, what the heck is that? Okay. So, it's not too bad. Okay. So, pictures could carry different interpretations behind them. But if we translate our pictures into words, yeah. we can simplify that and make only one meaning. Okay? Words could be a lot to write out, so what could we do instead? We could come up with symbols. You mean like how we have the word for fluorine and we've converted that into the symbol of F? Yes, exactly like that. That's why we do chemistry. It's the same thing. What happens with our bottom system here, where we've now converted bikes into wheels, and we would end up with eight, eight wheels. wheels. So the answer that you guys all did in your head, I have now shown work for. Notice that work for it shows how the units get converted through. And now you get eight points on the test. Okay. And now you get full credit if that was an exam question. That work you are awesome at when it's stuff you know. You don't know chemistry. That's why you're taking this class. Okay? 
So you need to have that formalized, written out process. That's what we're doing with our dimensional analysis. Kind of, sort of? Uh, we can, t and yeah, that's an entirely different system on what you just said. Oh, no. So, given six wheels and three frames, how many bikes can you make? More conversions. More conversions. Jeez, Mike, aren't you tired of this yet? No. No, I'm not, because you're still getting it wrong. When you get it right a couple times, then, so, I'm, I'm guessing you're not flashing gang symbols at me and you're trying to tell me an answer here. Dang it. Okay, I was hearing three bikes. So if I take six wheels, wheels into bikes, what was my conversion? Two wheels, one bike. The units of wheels cancels, I'd be left with units of bikes. Mathematically, that is six times one divided by two, which is three bikes. Awesome. Okay. But we also said three frames. You're like, well, Mike, I, I can do this work in my head. I'm fully aware that when we do this, that all says frames, that's going to get three bikes. Right? You did that in your head, and you're like, that was stupid, Mike. Don't write that out. What? Right? Everybody see at least the interpretation. Picasso wrote that. Okay? Right? Two wheels, how many bikes can be made? Ooh, this is fun. I got two different answers. I heard one, and I heard... No, I said none. None. Someone did say one. Okay. Why are we getting two different answers? Because we didn't read the question. There's more beyond that. Because we said two wheels equals one bike. We said two wheels equals one bike. All right, let's go back to what we had written up. Wheels, wheels, bike, bike, what did we have last time? Six wheels, six wheels, one bike, two wheels, and we said the answer was three bikes, right? Anywhere in that expression do I sew anything about frames? No. 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 Is there space to place frames into that expression? Yes. yes. Right, I see you shaking your head no, or are you just twisting in the wind? Okay. Where could I interpret frames into this expression? We could put the three frames next to the six wheels. I mean, you're going for a reason why. As another top one, and then do another conversion. What? Yeah, I agree. What? So that would be 18. That, that then changes the numbers. You have to do a second conversion. You have to do a second conversion. But I, it again comes back to the question that I asked. This statement here, which you said was true, no. says nothing about frames. It's only, it's only true if you're associating it with the other statement. It's only true if we make the assumption that we have enough frames to satisfy this equation. Okay. Are assumptions always bad? No. Sometimes they're true. Sometimes they're not. In that question, given just two wheels... To get the answer one, you made the assumption that there was an excess of the number of frames, that we had at least one frame. Otherwise, this was a silly question to ask. Okay. Given just two wheels, how many bikes could be made? Where in there does it make that clear statement? It unfortunately does not. So there ends up coming out two interpretations. One interpretation is that we are making the claim that there are enough frames that we can make however many we did, where wheels is what limits our answer. Given that question, right. just in a vacuum, 
given that vacuum. question in a vacuum with no other context, we would say we don't have any frames, we can't do this. This is where chemistry comes in, okay? Because chemistry will put this phrase to you, and in that system, we make the assumption that there's an excess of the other system. You may not like that, but that's what happens, okay? Because we have to make that assumption to come to this numerical answer. Without that assumption, you can't get three bikes as an answer with this conversion from that previous question. That answer is literally invalid because it doesn't factor in frames. We have to make the assumption that there are enough frames to combine out with those six wheels to get us three bikes. We can then test that assumption by looking for more information within the question. More information in the question says we have three frames. We can now test frames and see how many bikes would get made from those frames. If those numbers match, great, we're done. You've internalized all of those comparisons. In chemistry, you can't internalize it. You have to run through each of those conversions. Okay? Three wheels in two frames, how many bikes can be made? I heard none. Okay? I've heard one. How do we solve this? You're given, you're given three wheels and you want to get bikes. Given three wheels and I want to get bikes, how do I do that conversion? You put, you put one bike over three wheels so you have bikes. And, so the wheels cancel out and you have one bike. Two wheels. Two wheels. Can't we only have four of our answers? You're right. Sorry. Yeah. We'll address that in a second. One point five. Are you okay with the decimal? Can I write it as one point five bikes? Okay. The other conversion was two frames. Uh, we're doing bikes. One frame. That says frame. This equals. Two bikes. Why did you not say two? I didn't hear anybody say two bikes could be made. We literally do not have enough of the wheels. The wheels limit our ability to make more bikes. Okay? We aren't making any assumptions. It's literally telling us in the question how many bikes or wheels and frames we have. Okay? We literally do not have enough wheels to make two bikes. I still run the calculation and I compare those numbers. I run out of parts with the wheels. So the most I could make numerically would be one and a half bikes. Okay? And then we had a couple people jump in and say, well, you can't have half a bike. Is that true? Because we're trying to compare this to chemistry, and now we're saying, if this is can't, what, <laughs> Don't even worry about chemistry. Can you have half a bike? You give one of your kids a full bike and the other one a half. <laughs> you, you can't have half a bike. You can have a unicycle. That's not half a bike. Right? That, doesn't, that doesn't count. So, so, there is, there is no half so a bike. in this system, we can't have half a bike. So how many bikes are possible to make? One. 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 And what's the rest? Everybody's good with that? Salt. <laughs> okay. What if I change the system I'm looking at? That's not three wheels that's 3,000 wheels and 2,000 frames. I get to the same thing. Does everybody agree with that statement? Do I get to the same thing? I would end up with, somebody said it up here, I would end up with what? Not if it's 1,000. One of your children. You'd end up with 1,000. 3,000 wheels, 2,000 frames. Oh, you still have the same problem. It's just not on kilo. No, because you can't have 1,500 bikes. I would then have 1,500 bikes, and I would have 2,000. Oh, sorry. No, it should be 2,000, yeah. No. Yes. 2,000 bikes. 
Do I have the same issue? Kind of. How many bikes can I make? 1,500. Do I have a half a bike floating around? No. No, I have 1,500 whole bikes. Right. There is no issue here. I don't have half of a bike. I have 1,500 whole bikes. So scaling up can solve your problem. Scaling up can solve your problem. What's how? Where are those going? So let's pause. By scaling up, we remove this half, this fractional issue. Okay. Does chemistry need to scale up? Yes. yes. Why does chemistry have to scale up? Because you can always add, but you can't subtract. It's, it's you have to have whole number uh, ratios. No, Sean. Chemistry is too small. Bicycles are massive. Yeah. Right? I can work on a scale of a single bicycle or tens of bicycles. Can I work on the scale of a single molecule? No. no. I have to scale up. By scaling up, that removes this half issue. I can end up with fractional answers because it's not a fractional molecule, it's a fractional unit. <laughs> Begins with an M. Mole. Can I have half of a mole? Yes. Yes. Because a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Half of that is 3 point something times 10 to the 23rd. I can have half of a mole. So chemistry can scale up. I'm allowed to get fractional answers. That's fair game. I can't do that with large objects because with a single object, I can't get fractional systems. Okay? So this is the advantage behind the mole. I can scale up, and I don't worry about these fractional atoms. So far, so good. We're getting back to your question in a second. A question was then made, well, what the heck happened with the rest of the frames? They're salt. They're salt. They're what? They're salt? Excess salt? Uh, no, don't make that assumption. They're left over. They're just left over. They aren't converted into something else. They're just, I didn't use them. Okay. It's leftover starting material. I just didn't use it. That's fine. You don't have to use everything. Some of it just doesn't get reacted. Just because I didn't use the frames doesn't mean now, poof, they're now turned into tomatoes. Okay? They're still frames. They just don't have wheels. So they're not bikes yet. Okay? If I was in a bike factory, I'd probably be like, fire the person that bought my wheels they didn't, or the frames because they didn't buy the correct parent. Okay? But in chemistry, it just means it's left over. It's a leftover piece. That's okay. Not leftovers, leftovers, not leftovers. So there's a miscommunication there with English. It's not a leftover. Leftovers are not salts. Okay? So let's move to the next part of this before we've beaten or flogged our whatever those things are, bicycles to death. Given 40 grams of wheels and 15 pounds of frames, how many bikes can be made? Whoa, we need what? Whole new what? No. How do I do that? I can't possibly do that. How many grams of wheels equals one wheel? We need to know the number for those. I need to know the relationship between the mass and the number because what does the equation tell me? How many the number of those pieces, not the mass. So to solve this question, I need a conversion factor that converts the mass into a number of objects. Once I have that conversion factor, I'm now in the number. I can now use the chemical equation to convert from one species to another species or one substance to another. Chemistry has the same issue. Just because we move to a chemical reaction doesn't mean the chemical reaction now deals with mass. It doesn't. It's the same thing as, a, as building a bicycle. Okay? It's the number of atoms. Okay? So that deep breath may have just been for me. Just for me? Okay, so you guys are like, this is, this is stupid easy, so we're not even going to worry about it, right? We move to equations. We move to a chemical equation. 
we now get a whole bunch of conversion factors. The same conversion factors that come out of the chemical equation or the equation for making a bicycle. It's the same concept. Okay? Not ish, it's the same concept, period. Okay? NO, if I take two molecules of NO, how many molecules of O2 are necessary to react? One. That's what the chemical equation tells me. Okay? If I had two molecules of NO and some large excess of oxygen, how much NO2 could I make? Two molecules. The oxygen becomes irrelevant to the question because it's there in such a large amount that it doesn't determine the reaction. Right? So I could use units of molecules. What if I moved up to 2,000 molecules? Right? How do I know it's now 1,000 molecules of O2? What did I do to do that, get that system set up? You used your conversion factors of two molecules to one molecule. Two molecules of NO was one molecule O2. of O2. Your unit rate stays the same. My unit conversion system still stays the same. I'm just applying it in a new system. Okay? Then it went up to 1,000. Okay. The next one, 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, well, to convert that into O2, it's still the same process. I'm still using that very first conversion factor that I had established. Molecules and molecules. Okay. 10 to the 23rd, that sounds kind of familiar. That sounds kind of like Avogadro's number. If I factor Avogadro's number out of that equation... What happens? Your unit rate remains to one. The unit rate is still that 1 to 2. But if I factor Avogadro's number out of that, I would get 2 times Avogadro's number. Okay. What is Avogadro's number? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Yes. So 2 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd is magically. It's not magically. More delicious. 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd. What else is Avogadro's number? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd is something else. What is it? It's a mole. You mean 2 times Na, where Na is moles, is 2 moles? Yeah. That's exactly what I mean. Okay. So the chemical equation can be used for individual atoms and molecules. Okay, which, as we established, makes no sense because we can't run reactions with individual atoms or molecules. So we scale it up. Yes, technically true. We can scale it up to moles. The conversion system is still 100% valid. So instead of now using molecules in my conversion factor, I can use moles. Because that's all it is, is a scale-up factor. That's the power and the beauty of moles. That's the power and beauty of the chemical equation. Because I now have a way to convert substances in that chemical equation. I can convert from nitrogen oxide to nitrogen dioxide if I'm given the chemical equation. Okay? That's the beauty of that system. Okay? If you're having problems processing what that means... Talk to me after class, and I will work my best to find a chemical equation that matches a real-world system that you can then scale and compare to. Okay. This one gets close, but not quite. What's UV stand for? UV just means ultraviolet, meaning to get this reaction to run, we have to use an extra piece. We have to use light to get this to go. Yes? What are we going to scale up by? That's an interesting question. Because I could scale up by thousands if I wanted. Or tens. Or tens. Or hundred thousands. What am I going to scale up by? Moles. Because moles are going to scale up to a measurable amount. That was the whole point of moles. That's what we talked about in the previous, on previous day, Monday, was that we're trying to just get that up to a measurable mass. Once we're at that measurable mass, we're cool. The mole value, or that mole amount, is what sets that system up for us. So when we scale, we're either looking at the atomic level, which is really bad, or moles. 
we don't look at the intervenes. Okay? So all of those intervals are just saying what happens. Okay? The top one, molecules. If I made those thousands of molecules, we're just using the conversion factors established in that top line to convert it into a new system or the thousand base. Okay? After that, they're now showing powers of 10 with the 10 to the 23rd. Okay? They picked that particular scalar factor because that scalar factor is a mole, which now allows them to get to the bottom one. So when we're looking at units for our conversion factors from a chemical equation, there are two conversion factors we use. The molecule system, black was a horrible one to box in. We can use our molecule conversions, or we can use our mole conversions. If you go back and look at the video from Monday, where we were dealing with converting fluorine atoms to fluorine molecules, there was a conversion factor there. And we said it was two fluorine molecules equaled one, or two fluorine atoms equaled one fluorine molecule. The other conversion factor we listed, two moles of fluorine molecules, atoms, equals one mole of fluorine molecules. Those conversion factors we're using again just now in the context of the chemical equation. It's identical in that processing. Okay. Moles is just a scalar factor upwards. Okay. It's a beautiful thing for that reason. Okay. I'm going to take another deep breath. Mole-mole relationships. This is just another way of looking at the same thing. We've got a variety of relationships that can come out of it. We tend to default to mole relationships and not molecules because moles are the n amount of atoms that we need to work with to have a measurable mass. Okay? So we don't tend to use molecules, we tend to use moles. All of those expressions come from the proper balanced chemical equation. Anybody have any questions about those conversions? Okay, maybe you'll regret that. How many moles of CO2 are necessary to make one mole of sodium hydrogen carbonate? Okay, so if we look at our question, we've got a couple things going on with this. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is do this. Okay, and we'll talk about why in a second. Step with all conversions. Every question we do, Great. what do you need to do? Great way to wind up. What do we want? Uh, one, one mole of sodium, sodium hydrogen carbonate. I want one mole of sodium hydrogen carbonate? What was I given? We want how many? I was given moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So if I'm trying to find the moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate, what did I just do? I'm done. We want how many moles of CO2. What I'm solving for is moles of CO2. What am I given? Um, Whoops. One mole of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Oh, I said CO2, so I can write CO2. Okay, I was given one mole Close enough. Anybody writing that being like, I don't want to write sodium hydrogen carbonate. That's annoying. Right. Yep. Yeah, why, why would that be annoying? Because it's long. That's long. That's a lot of letters. It takes a lot of space. I wonder if we invented a system that would allow us to not have to do that. Oh, we did. That was nomenclature. nomenclature, chapter 6. So one of the complications within this question, guess what you needed to know? Nomenclature, so that you knew what you were starting with. Sodium, hydrogen, carbonate. Okay. To convert, is moles the same? 
So the unit mole show up in the answer and what we're given. Well, yes. So the unit's the same. What's not the same? We're looking for CO2 not substance. The substance is not the same. How do we convert substances? Multiple relationships. Right. Multiple relationships. Where do we find multiple relationships? What's that? No. <laughs> Previous slide. No. Um, Mike told us very nicely. In the what? In the chemical equation or the chemical formula. Okay. Chemical formula was chapter 8. Given F2, how many Fs were present? Two Fs. Okay. How did you get that 2? It comes from the chemical formula formula for F2. We know that to be true. That's what the formula tells us. So to answer this question, what do I need to have? The chemical formula of CO3. I could have the chemical formula, but what's the problem? Is CO2 in sodium hydrogen carbonate? No. No. It's sodium hydrogen carbonate, not carbon dioxide. So I can't use a chemical formula to do this conversion. What do I need? The chemical formula of the carbon and the oxygen. No. I need the chemical equation. Remember how I said we're going to come back to this in a second? To answer this question, what do we need? The chemical equation. What did some punk just do? Erase the chemical equation. You would need to know the chemical equation to do this conversion. Okay. Right? If you aren't given that information, you're SOL. Yes, A. Yes, A. Check the front of the exam and hope it, it tells you. Okay, so let's go back to, where's the chemical equation? There it is. So there's our chemical equation. Is this a chemical equation that you would be expected to be able to predict? Yes. Sure. What type of chemical reaction is this? It is a combination reaction. Are you expected to predict combination reactions? So this is fun. Okay. I'm not going to answer that question. You're going to answer it by going back and taking a look at the notes that you took in the previous unit when we talked about combination reactions. If you don't have notes, there's an awesome handy-dandy tool online called the video of the lecture. Review that video and determine whether or not you're supposed to know that equation. That is neither here nor there for the sake of this question. We are given the chemical equation. How do we solve this? We have to make sure our equation is balanced. Is it balanced? We don't know. Let's find out. Okay? Because it's possible that you have some kind of a jerk for an instructor that didn't give you a balanced chemical equation. No. Okay? No. You would never have someone like that. I wonder if this kind of sarcasm makes it into the video. How many sodiums are on the left-hand side of the equation? Uh, two. two. How many sodiums on the right hand side? Two. Right? Someone actually watching the video right now? Find it? I actually just okay. have it in my notes. <laughs> okay. Can I balance CO3? Uh, yeah. Carbonate does show up as a product on the other side. Why can I not balance CO3? Because of CO2. Because CO2 shows up. I wouldn't have anything to balance the CO2 out with. Okay. So I cannot balance whoops, the complex ion CO3. Okay. Should I start with carbon? Probably not best to start balancing with carbon. Why? Carbon shows up twice on the reactant side. Carbon could be a difficult one to balance because it shows up in two different locations. That doesn't mean it is difficult. It could be. Okay. So oxygen is absolutely almost always, the, almost always the last one you should do because oxygen typically shows up in lots of different locations. Carbon is showing up in lots of different locations too. So both of them are difficult here. So we should skip both carbon and oxygen and move straight to hydrogen. hydrogen. How many hydrogens on the left-hand side of the equation? Two. Hydrogens on the right-hand side? One. Oh, two. Forgot the two. Happens. Okay. Now we're kind of stuck. We have to deal with carbon or oxygen. 
I would argue we should deal with carbon first because oxygen shows up in more places. So carbon. Two carbons on the left and two on the right. Oxygens. Six on the left, there's two, three, plus another three, we've got six, and on the right, six. Oh, well, look at that, your instructor wasn't a complete dick after all. Yet. Touche. Okay, so now that we know our chemical equation is balanced, we can now potentially go back to solving our question. To solve the question, what do we need to do? I need to convert the unit of moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Why do I want to place it in the denominator? Because then it cancels out the top. So one. that it can cancel with the other unit that was already placed in the numerator. What unit do I want to have show up on top? Uh, CO2. Moles Don't CO2. quite accept that. Moles CO2. of CO2. Where do I find the conversion factor between moles of CO2 and moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate? From the chemical equation. What? Where? Okay. Where? Okay. What is mole? It's a counting. It's a counting of what? Atoms. Okay. Can I say atoms of CO2? No. No. What is it counting? I can say molecules. What does the chemical equation tell me? Molecules. How many molecules of CO2? One. one. Where'd you get that one from? It's the imaginary coefficient in front of the CO2. Yeah, the okay. <laughs> Remember when we said that you had to know how to sum the coefficients? This becomes one of the reasons. You have to be able to interpret that there's a one there. Okay. What shows up with the sodium hydrogen carbonate? Two, because... There's a 2 in front of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So if we run our calculation, what do we get? Half a mole. Oh my god, a fractional value. I can't have fractional values. Those are horrible. What is a mole? Oh, it's a large number of moles. It is a massive number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Can I have half of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd moles? Yes. yes. Absolutely. That is a perfectly fair thing to go through and do. Half a mole is valid. Okay? So, where are we with that? It's solved. It's solved, Okay. So we've got some thumbs up in the back. If you're still having problems with that, finding where those things come from, talk to me after class. Okay, or continue to go through with these. What is the mass in grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate produced when two moles of CO2 are consumed? What? No, you can't do that. Just did. Turn everything into grams. Assign the appropriate weights to everything. So if we follow the patterns that I've gone through and established is that we want to, right now we want grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay. And we're starting with two moles of CO2. I heard a suggestion convert everything into grams. Okay, so I could convert the moles of CO2 into grams. What's then going to be the problem? It needs to turn into sodium hydrogen Carbonate. If I give you 40 grams of frames and 50 pounds of wheels, how many bikes did you make? Something. We have no clue. The mass does not allow me to convert through the chemical equation. What do I need? To change it first. I need the moles. I need the number of them. I'm starting with the number of CO2. So moles of CO2 is not my final answer because grams is wrong and the substance is wrong. How can I convert the substance? By moles. Through the chemical equation in units of moles or molecules. I'm in moles, so let's not go to molecules. Let's stick in moles. Okay. What do I want? Uh, 
on the top. Moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Why did I not say grams? Because we haven't converted into grams yet. Nope. Why can I not say grams? Because we're not converting into mass yet. Well, that's irrelevant. Why can I not say grams? Because we're working with the number of atoms and not the mass. The conversion between substances goes through the chemical equation, which does not have mass. It has units of the number of the species. It's moles, not mass. Okay. What numbers are associated with those units? Two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate came from one mole of CO2. What unit would we have? Moles of hydrogen, sodium hydrocarbonate. We would have moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Is that what I want for an answer? No, I want grams. So moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate, grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate. I wish there was a relationship between the mass and moles. Mass, moles, mass, moles, molar mass, which is found on the periodic table. I would then have to go through and add up the masses of all of the elements found in sodium hydrogen carbonate. Sodium, because we have that stupid lazy instructor again. 23, hydrogen 1, carbon 12, oxygen 16, plus 16, plus 16, because there's three of them. I add that all up and that magically becomes 70 something? Did you really do that in your head, 70, 72? 74 units of what? What are the units? 74 watts. Grams, my mass, per mole. The 74 shows up where in my conversion factor? No. No. Where does the 84 show up? With the grams, yeah, back to that. Make sure you have the right numbers. 84, what shows up in front of moles? One. I can now go through, take everything in the numerator, multiply it out. Two times two is four times 84. Uh, I don't know. Uh, one times one is one, so I'll get two times two times 84. What's four times 84? 336 grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate when two moles of CO2 are consumed. Okay. Remember how with that previous question we said something about like bikes? If I gave you two bi or two wheels, how many bikes could you make? And we had one or zero. We had that big long debate over, well, but you didn't say anything about frames. This is where it shows up. What is being implied within this question? That we have enough of the sodium carbonate and we have enough of the water to react with the CO2. That is implied or implicit within the question. We have to function under that assumption. If we do not function under that assumption, the entire question becomes unsolvable. And that's what right. it means by consumed. Okay. That consumed is kind of our sneaky backhanded way of avoiding addressing the other elements because we're saying CO2 was consumed, we've provided a chemical equation, that's how the CO2 was consumed. So we do make lots of assumptions within that. There's actually more assumptions made. If you want to talk about those, you can talk with me after class. Okay? But we now have a conversion factor. That conversion, or that, not conversion factor, we have now used multiple conversion factors. Where did we get the two to one conversion factor? From the chemical equation. Where is that conversion factor discussed in our textbook? Chapter 9. Okay. 
The concept of the chemical equation is addressed in chapter 7. Okay. The conversion factor is addressed in chapter 9. Okay. Where do we find the, conver the next conversion factor? That came, oh, sorry, I have to erase all that. Came from our periodic table. Okay, that was easy. Cool, you've got a conversion factor. Keep using it. Okay, where is the concept of that conversion factor addressed? Chapter 8. Okay, largely because it says at the bottom, moles. That's our chapter 8. So read chapter 8, talk to me after class. Oh, because, because it's moles, that's our connection. Okay? So what we are doing in chapter 8 and chapter 9 is just doing conversions. Okay? Chapter 8 is just mole conversions within a single substance. Okay? And that we can look at elements within that substance. We can look at atoms, which is a horrible calculation, but we end up doing it anyway. Okay, chapter 9, we now scale up to chemical reactions and look at doing those exact same conversions with one extra conversion factor. There's an entire chapter on that one extra conversion factor. Okay, why? Because you need the practice with it. All we're looking at is layering multiple conversion factors in. The more conversion factors we layer in, the more everybody goes, oh my God, I can't do that. You can if you follow dimensional analysis. Because what we end up doing is layering multiple conversions in in one system. It allows us to do this. Okay, that is the power of it. Okay, that's what makes it not new content. And really, both chapter 8 and chapter 9 should really just say, chapter 8, here's your conversion factor, Avogadro's number. Chapter 9 says, we already discussed this conversion factor. It was the chemical equation when we talked about it in chapter 7. Okay, that's the end of those chapters. Everything else they're doing is just practice, finding that information, using that information. It gets used by applying it back to your dimensional analysis, trying to establish ways to get your units to change. <sighs> Sorry, I'm using all the oxygen in the room. Okay. Really, another one? Yes. Set it up. How many moles of oxygen react with 2.25 moles of nitrogen? We've got the basics written up there. I want moles of N2 as a unit to be converted into something else. So I'm going to put that on the denominator so that it can be canceled. Put moles of O2 on top. I want moles of O2 on top because I want moles of O2 in my answer. I'm now looking at a conversion factor between substances in units of moles. Moles is just a scalar factor for molecules. Am I allowed to convert the number of one molecule to a number of another molecule? Sure. How? Chemical equation. Through the chemical equation. Am I given one? Yes. Yes. What else has to be true about that chemical equation? It and it better be balanced. Is it balanced? Yes. 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 Which means? You can use the coefficients from your equation. This becomes 1 and 1. And I'd get an answer. 2.25 moles of O2. Let's double pack. 2.25 moles of N2. I have a fourth of a mole of N2. I can't have a fourth of a molecule of N2. That's impossible. But it's a mole. It's not a molecule. It's a mole which was 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. I can have a fourth of a massive number. That's allowed. Okay. Same thing's going to happen at the end. I can have a fourth of a massive number. That's fair game. Okay. So don't freak out at those fractional notations that, yes, in a math class they would have told you, well, you can't have those fractions. Okay. We can have those fractions because we're looking at a huge number of these. Okay. There's our beautiful work. We did that one. Okay. So I want to end on this. We'll pick it up with, as a quiz on Monday. This question should look kind of familiar because that looks kind of like what? It looks like a test question. That's because it did come off the test. That was on exam two. 
All right? Remember on exam two, even though for... By the way, I figured out what was wrong with the reading. You can ask me about that later. You weren't supposed to know anything about moles. Right? There's moles in that, but we hadn't talked about moles. How could you possibly solve that? Right? All of the conversion factors are given to you. You just have to use the information supplied. Right? Uh, one mole of oxygen consumed produces two moles of water. Where is that coming from? A chemical equation, which if you go back and look at your exam two, what was the question immediately before this one? Write the chemical equation for hydrogen plus oxygen to produce water. If you look at the coefficients, if everything was done properly, that's where it came from. We can talk about the chemical equation later. 16 grams of oxygen equals one mole of oxygen. What's wrong with that? Nope. Inversion. Uh, Oxygen atom is 16. Okay. That is the molar mass. Oxygen as a formula is not 16. It is 32 because oxygen is a diatomic molecule. Okay. So all of those conversion factors in parentheses are things that you are responsible for knowing. Your quiz on Monday will become the next level of what you're responsible for, that. Everything else is something that you are responsible for already knowing right, and determining. That's what we'll start Monday with. I'll give you no more than five minutes on Monday to finish it.